chapters 11 to 13. I mean, it's uh, everything is in sevens. And that is God's perfect number is seven. All right. Now, to give you just a little background on Revelation, we won't do much because remember, we're not covering the entire book. And it would take quite a while to cover the entire book. I've got a church in Wheeler County next month that wants me to do the whole book. I'm, I'm still not sure what kind of excuse I can come up with to keep from going there. But it is very difficult to cover this whole book in a brief time. You, you can summarize it, but as far as covering it and going into detail, it takes quite a bit. But I'm glad you're here, and it means a lot to me for you to be here. Uh, this is the best attendance that I can remember in the past few years here at Mount Vernon. And, and I really think a lot of it is people are hungry for prophecy because most churches do not say much about prophecy. And, and I've heard a lot of, no, nobody's told me this, but, uh, but, but church members, the preacher has told a church member, and church members told me that the preacher doesn't like to study Revelation because, you know, uh, he doesn't understand it. But I can tell you one thing, and I may have told you this last night because, you know, I'm getting where I repeat myself quite a bit. There's one verse in the book of Revelation that tells you what's going to happen to the devil. If you took the book of Revelation out of your Bible and just said, we're not going to study that. We're going to stop with Jude. Uh, we'll study the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Synoptic Gospels, but we're not going to study Revelation because we don't understand it. You would never know who was going to win, God or Satan. There's been a conflict going on for thousands of years. We don't even know how long, it's, but thou, at least thousands of years, between God and Satan. In other words, dear, we are in a war. We are in a war. Most of us don't know it. We think we're coming to a picnic when we come to church, and we're coming to a battle. If you don't think there's a battle, try to pay attention tonight and see what happens. There'll be a battle, everything in the world will go through your mind in the next hour. But it's hard, and I know it's hard, and I appreciate those of you, if you hear most of what I say, that's good. And I do believe that our sound people here, and you've got the, the finest sound system of any church I go to, uh, I think they can make you DVDs and stuff, or CDs, or whatever. All right, now having said that, let's just look at a little background on the book of Revelation. Um, on your outline, and I do not have an outline up here, so don't bring me one. That, that takes too much time. I'll just make it up. Uh, I'll watch the screen. The author of the book of Revelation, just to give you a little background now, so uh, even though we're not going to go through but three chapters, you'll, you'll at least get this. The author is John, and this is the same John who wrote the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It is the same John who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, which are short books over towards the end of the Bible as well. So he wrote in total five books. Uh, Paul wrote at least 13, some say 14. I say 13, but I'm in the minority. But anyway, uh, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> I know I haven't written any of them, so uh, all of these are doing better than I am. But John wrote five of the New Testament books. Now, this is the same John who was an apostle. You know, it was James and John, the sons of Zebedee, right? Am I right on that? It's been a while since I've studied the apostles. And John was the one who was, is known as the apostle of love. And he would often identify himself in his writings as one who leaned over on Jesus' breast. Like when they were having a meal, like the Last Supper or whatever, John would sit next to Jesus and lean over. He loved Jesus. And 
John was the only one of the 12 original apostles who lived to draw his social security. All of the others were martyred, uh, usually at a rather young age. And yet we're told today by the television preachers that we ought to be prosperous and everything should be going well. And if you become a Christian, everything's going to be lovely from then on. Explain to me then why Jesus was crucified and why his disciples were all put to death, violent death. And many of the early church were thrown to lions and burned at the stake and, and, and all of that. And yet we have the... We have the uh, gall to think that uh, we're going to be prosperous if we become a Christian. I call it a false prophet. And uh, our television is eaten up with it. It doesn't matter if you got six Christian channels, you'll be doing good to get one Christian program out of those six Christian channels. Uh, every now and then you'll get a good program. Not all TV preachers are false prophets. People like Charles Stanley and David Jeremiah, you can trust them. And there are others. That's not the only two, but uh, they're, they're probably the two most famous. But anyway, the author is John. The date of the book of Revelation is around 95 A.D. 95 A.D., which would put uh, the book about... 60 years after Jesus had gone back to heaven. Most of the New Testament had been completed 25, 30 years, some even 40 years earlier. So the book of Revelation is like a, in, in a way it looks like an add-on because all these other books had been written for years and then Revelation is written and uh, the early church fathers, though, realized this was an anointed book. And it is the only book of prophecy in the New Testament. And the Old Testament's got plenty of prophets. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Habakkuk, Zechariah, Zach, uh, you know, Zephaniah, uh, on and on. Nahum, Obadiah, all those were prophets. But in the New Testament, <clears throat> the only book of prophecy is Revelation. So that makes it really stand out. The key verse we'll go over tonight is chapter 1, verse 19. And in that verse, it gives the outline of the entire book. It says, Write those things which thou hast seen, and things which are, and those things which shall be. So you have there three things. The things which uh, thou hast seen is chapter 1. The things which are is chapters 2 and 3. And the things which shall be are chapters 4 to 22. So uh, that's the key verse of the book. Uh, one more thing I want to add before we start into the text. Many people complain that they do not understand the book of Revelation, that they try to read it, but it doesn't make sense. And a lot of it is because there's a lot of symbols in the book, uh, dragons and so forth, symbolic stuff. But here's the problem. <clears throat> in the book of Revelation, there's 22 chapters. There's approximately 350 quotes or references or allusions to something in the Old Testament. Now that's a lot. 22 chapters, 350 allusions or references to the Old Testament. So, somebody is a new Christian. They've just been saved. They're real excited. They want to know the future. So they're going to start in the book of Revelation. Do you see what their problem is? They don't understand the Old Testament. And therefore, when they run into these things in the New Testament here, they're not going to know what it means. In fact, uh, I'll try to point out a few of them, but I won't think to do all of them, I'm sure. All right. So, uh, by the way, the verse that will tell you what will happen to the devil is chapter 20, verse 10. 
if you did not study the book of Revelation, you know, I know you don't want to be ugly to anybody, but anybody here tonight that's visiting, if your preacher says, I don't want to study the book of Revelation because I don't understand it, if you wanted to, you could ask your preacher, well, how do we know who's going to win the battle of history between God and Satan? And if that preacher says God, you could ask him, well, how do you know that? See, you got him pinned that, uh, there, he's in a trap. But you wouldn't do that to your preacher, would you? He's too nice a guy. Thank you. But he should be <laughs> studying the, the book of Revelation anyway. All right, chapter 1. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ, all right? You'll notice that revelation is singular. Uh, for the people who say, uh, I can't understand it, it's a dark mystery to me, I'm trying to read it and it doesn't make sense. Uh, I will be honest, I don't understand everything in the book of Revelation. You could pick out a verse and, and uh, that I might not could understand but again, I, I believe it, and I understand enough of it to know what's going to happen. I don't have to know every little detail. The book of Revelation is like a puzzle with 5,000 pieces. You put them together. I don't have all 5,000 of the pieces, but I got enough to see what the picture looks like. Revelation comes from a Greek word, apocalypsos, and this is for the intellectuals here tonight. I have to always be aware that in the audience... We may have PhDs, we may have people with college degrees and master's degrees, and, and so this is for you. For the rest of you, we'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, but uh, it, it means revealing. All right, look at the word, revelation. Look at the first part of the word, revelation. See, it's revealing. If I said I'm going to reveal something to y'all, after church tonight, I'm going to reveal how much cake I ate. I can say this, I would have ate more, but the cake I was eating, somebody else ate it too. But uh, anyway, I, I had plenty. Uh, don't, don't worry, I'm not going to be stopping at uh, McDonald's on the way home. But it's, if I said I'm going to reveal something to you, it means something you don't maybe know, and I'm going to reveal something, you know, uh, like I could reveal something about myself, but you wouldn't really care, so I'm not going to do that. The revelation of Jesus Christ, so be aware now, because in the old-timey Bibles, I can remember as a little boy, old-timey Bibles used to have as a title the revelation of St. John the Divine. First of all, he's not, John is not divine, so... Uh, something's wrong there, but they've changed it now. The revelation of Jesus Christ, all right, which gave, un, which God gave unto him, okay? So this whole book, even though there's a lot of chapters and a lot of stuff going on, is, is considered one revelation. To show unto his servants, that word servants, if we still have any intellectuals here, it's doulos in the Greek. It means one who chooses to be a servant when he could go free. In the Old Testament, the way they did that is they bored a hole in their ear. And, and that way, when you saw that servant, and he had a hole bored in his ear. He wasn't trying to get a tattoo, but it was just a, a way of saying, I have chosen to stay with my master even though legally I could walk out. So... That's the way we are tonight, aren't we, class? Are, aren't you a servant of Jesus voluntarily? Okay. Somebody may have, if you're a child, somebody may have made you come to church tonight. But if you're, if you're a true Christian, you are a voluntary servant. I am a servant of Jesus because I want to be. You know, if, if Jesus said you can walk away, and, and be lost, I wouldn't do it. I, I still would rather be a servant. So that's what he means. He says, God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now some of you might be thinking, 
this book was written uh, nearly 2,000 years ago, 1,900 years ago, and it hadn't happened yet. Some of the stuff in here hadn't happened yet. And yet it says here things which must shortly come to pass. Well, the word shortly is the problem. The word shortly mean, to us means if I said uh, I'm going to stop talking shortly, that mean, well, that means nothing really. But, uh, <laughs> you know, to us, it, it's like it's going to happen pretty quick, shortly. Shortly, uh, the uh, baseball season is going to start because they already, you know, be going to spring practice and all that. I'm talking about Major League Baseball. All right. But shortly in the Bible here means that once it begins, it will happen quickly. We get our word, English word, and so I ought to have a witness here, tachometer. Got a tachometer on your automobile. Got a speedometer and a tachometer uh, or an od and odometers and all that. But anyway, uh, that's where this word comes from. It means that once things start happening, now think about it. Remember what I talked about yesterday about all this technology? We didn't have that stuff just a few years ago. It come up quick, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue. We're, we're suffering in America from a, a cultural overload. There, there's things going on that we can't keep up with, and we get frustrated. Uh, that's another reason we don't need 24-hour news networks. There's not enough news to be on 24 hours. Uh, news networks should be limited to one hour, and then if they want to have some other programs the rest of the time, that's up to them. But we don't have enough stuff. That's why they will always want to keep something arguing and debated on TV because they're trying to keep you watching as long as they can because 24 hours... They can tell you the world's news in about 10 or 15 minutes, really. Blessed are the days when the news network just gave the news. And they didn't try to tell you what you should be believing. Believe it or not, that, that happened at one time. All right, and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. That word signified, what's the first four letters spell? There'll be signs in the book. See, that's why some people get confused. So how do we know when to take something literally and, or to say that that's just a sign or a symbol of something? A guy years ago made a classic statement. He says, if the text makes sense, don't try to find some other sense for it or you'll end up with nonsense. So... If the text makes sense. Now, when it gets to Revelation chapter 12, I believe it is, talks about a dragon chasing a woman and all, that is obviously symbolic. But when stuff uh, makes sense, don't try to look for another sense. Verse 2, who bear a record. By the way, verse 1 told us uh, John's name there, but we'll get it again in a minute. Who bear a record of the word of God, and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things, watch carefully, that he saw. What is a witness? When you go to a black church, black preachers like to say, do I have a witness? I like that so much I started using it. You know, I'll say, do I have a witness? Do we have a witness here? You know what a witness is? It's one who tells what he saw. What if I heard about a bad wreck on I-16 and I went to court and said, I, I'm a witness. And they said, uh, well, did you see the wreck? And I said, no, but I read about it on Facebook. That's not a witness. A witness is someone who tells what he has seen, what he knows. How do you know Jesus is a Savior? Because you have trusted him. That's the only way you can be a witness. So John's here in verse 2, it says, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now, can we agree tonight, class, that John would make an adequate witness? He was the only one of the 12 left. 
that would be, now, now I might would include Paul in there because, you know, Paul was a, a latecomer, but uh, John is definitely qualified to be a witness. He is qualified to tell us what Jesus taught and uh, said. Verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Do you know, I believe that if you read any of the 66 books of the Bible, you will be blessed. Do y'all believe that? That you will be blessed. If you, read any, if you read any of the Bible, you will be blessed. However, the book of Revelation is the only book that specifically tells you that you will be blessed. If you read, it says, Blessed is he that readeth. So it doesn't say blessed is he that understandeth. You might, not, you might read it and, and not understand everything, but you'll still be blessed. But what if you can't read? What if you are illiterate? Well, blessed are they that hear. Okay, faith comes by hearing. Suppose you can't read, or you try to read it and you don't understand it. Listen, we're trying to teach you what it means. Blessed are they that hear. You won't find any other book making this promise. Why would a preacher not, I know I'm sort of kicking a dead horse here, but why would a preacher not want to preach a book that you would be blessed if you read it and blessed if you heard it, even if you didn't understand everything in it. It's a puzzle. Don't send me an email. I'm trying to back off of social media. And Now you'll notice also it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. So the Bible there tells us that this is a prophecy. It's a prophecy not because I say so, it's not a prophecy because the Southern Baptists might say so. It's a prophecy because the Bible says so. So we know that this is a prophecy. The Southern Baptists, whoever picked out this book, was careful enough not to direct us into that part of the book, but it's still a prophecy. But now here's the part we don't notice. It talks about they that read the book, they that hear the book, then it says, keep those things that are written therein for the time is at hand. See, that's the hardest part. It's easy to read it. It's easy to listen to somebody. But are you going to keep what you learn? Are we going to come here three nights, study these churches, and let it go in one ear and out the other? Then we really won't benefit. But if we keep, it's a military term, actually. Keep these things. I always say, you know, a lot of people go to, when you talk about prophecy, people come just to hear what you got to say, and then they'll go home and listen to, to some other guy that's on TV just to see if he's different from me or whatever, and, and that's not doing any good. You know, we need to keep what we've learned. Verse 4, John... He gives us his name there. We already, I've already told you, but that's how I knew. It's right there in the text. John. Now notice he doesn't say St. John. He doesn't say uh, <clears throat> John uh, uh, the Divine or whatever. Uh, he doesn't tell us his, what college he went to or seminary. He's just plain old John. You know, the best compliment somebody can give you it's just brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. We don't have to be called right reverends or, uh, you know, uh, doctor so-and-so, Ph.D., D.D.S., whatever. <laughs> it's just brother John. That would be good enough. That's the highest. Sometimes people ask me, you know, what would you like me to call you? Because a lot of people are in churches where I go to that are my former students. And uh, I just, it would just brother Robert would be fine. Uh, that, that'll be good enough. John to the seven churches. Remember what is God's main number? Seven. 
So we're going to look at seven churches, and they will be on your map so you can find them. John to the seven churches. Now, there were more than seven churches back then. I don't know how many there were, but there were more than seven. These were all located in a certain area. He says here, uh, seven churches which are in Asia. Now, when we think of Asia, if you think of anything, because I don't know if geography is even taught anymore. I'm not sure that history is taught anymore in school. But uh, <clears throat> when you think about Asia, you know, I think about China or, or India or somewhere like that. But this, this doesn't mean that. This is Asia Minor is what it was called back then. It is the modern day country of Turkey. In fact, I saw a little booklet one day. A guy wrote, it says, let's talk Turkey. <clears throat> it's real cute. All of these, all seven of these churches were located in the western area of what is now Turkey. <clears throat> John to the seven churches, grace be unto you and peace. Now that sounds like Paul writing, but it's John. Grace and peace are two of Paul's favorite terms. And they're in the right order. You can't have peace without grace. Grace is, that, uh, is the undeserved favor of God. If I had what I deserved, I'd be in hell this very minute. But it's because of grace, amazing grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. It's a word that when I was first saved, I knew that grace was in our songbook, but I didn't really understand grace. God's grace is why we're here tonight. We could all have been all of us have had experiences where we could have easily been killed, whether it was in a wreck or, or something, but it's God's grace. Grace and peace from him which is, past tense, and which was, I'm sorry, is present, was past tense, and which is to come, future tense. So God was around in the beginning and he will be around when it's all over. And as Brother Darrell said, one of the reasons we need to study our Bible, if you don't study, you better get a double dose of Valium when you go back to your doctor. Because if you keep up with the news, you will end up with high blood pressure and everything else. But if you know that God is the same God who brought the children of Israel out of the wilderness, the same God that stayed with the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, he's the same God that's going to help us in 2019. All right. And from the seven spirits, did you notice that spirits is capitalized? Now, I'll be honest with you, dear. This is difficult. This is difficult. On a scale of one to five, this would be a five. This is hard. Uh... But obviously, again, remember what I told you. If, if the reading makes common sense, don't look for any other sense. This doesn't make sense. There are not seven Holy Spirits. If there were seven Holy Spirits, they'd be nine members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and seven spirits. So it has to have some other meaning. All right, Bible scholars who are smarter than I am, but this makes sense to me now, I'll offer you an explanation. If y'all don't like it, you know, you can speak Sunday and give a different explanation or the next conference. But it appears that what that means is that the Holy Spirit, and it's obviously referring to the Holy Spirit because it's capitalized, has seven specific ministries that he does. Now, if you would read Isaiah 11 and 2, I did not ask them to throw that on the screen. I'm not going to turn over there. But if you would read Isaiah 11 and 2, it will tell you the seven ministries of the Holy Spirit. Now, to me, that makes sense. And if it's something else, then I don't know it. All right, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Jesus is a faithful witness. In the day of judgment, when you and I stand before God, 
Jesus will witness, he will say, Father, this is one of ours. I was there the night he was saved. I was there the morning he was saved. I was there when he was out in the field plowing with a mule and got down on his knees. And uh, In other words, he will be a faithful witness. When I stand before God, I'm going to need some help. There ain't going to be no lawyer that I can call that will get me into heaven. But if Jesus is a faithful witness, and he says, I know that in uh, February of 1964 that uh, he went to a preacher's house and the preacher showed him how to be saved and he prayed the sinner's prayer, that is a faithful witness. Jesus said if we were ashamed of him here, he would be ashamed of us at the judgment. That's Matthew 10, 32. He is a faithful witness. Now watch this. He's still talking about Jesus and the first begotten of the dead. Now how can that be? Because in the Old Testament, Elijah brought somebody back from the dead and Elisha brought somebody back from the dead and Jesus raised three people at least from the dead. So that's five and yet the Bible says he's the first begotten of the dead. How can that be? 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says he's the first fruits of them that slept. 1 Corinthians 15, 23 says he's the first fruits. How is that possible? I know you all know the cat's just got your tongue, so I'm going to go ahead. Because of time, I'm going to go ahead and tell you what it means. Uh, all the others that were raised, they died again. They were, in a sense, resuscitated. But when Jesus came forth from the tomb, he did not go back. In other words, one of the men he raised was Lazarus, Martha and Mary's brother. Lazarus died again, though, see. But Jesus is the first begotten from the dead. He's the first one that came forth from the grave and is still alive. All the others who came forth died again. He's the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Uh, he is, of course, the, the king of, of everything. He owns it all. Unto him that loved us, people who study languages say that is in the present tense, and it should be translated loves, L-O-V-E-S. He still loves us and washes us from our sins in his own blood. You know why he needs to do that? Because I sin daily. How about y'all? If you made it through today without sinning it, not me. Even if I stayed in bed all day, I would sin because I'd be thought something bad. You know, your sin's not just what you do, it's what you think, what you are. So he washes us because I need, that doesn't mean now that we're re-saved every day, but it means that we, we uh, are cleansed every day has made us kings and priests unto God and his father now we're a kingdom of priests we may not look like much but we got some royal people here tonight Queen Elizabeth isn't here but uh, there's a lot of royalty in the building behold he cometh with clouds verse 7 and every eye shall see him and they which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. That's one of the verses that tell the difference between the second coming of Christ and the, and the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church, nobody will see him when he comes except those who are ready for him. They will be taken away. Everybody else won't know what happened. But at this, the second coming, every eye will see him. All the ones that pierced him, the, the ones that... The people that have rejected him, they'll all see him when he comes again. That's one of the major differences between the rapture and the second coming. Verse 8, I am Alpha and Omega. Now those were the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. I happen to know three letters of the Greek alphabet. I have been studying. Not only is Alpha the first letter of the Greek alphabet, but I know the second letter, do y'all? Beta. It's where we get the word alphabet, alpha, beta. All right? But other than that, 
That's all I know about the Greek. There's 21 letters I don't know. All right, he's the first and the last. I used to have students at school ask me where God come from. I bet if you're a Sunday school teacher, some of those kids have asked you that. Where did God come from? Uh, you know, you just have to, you have to pray on that one. But God didn't come from anywhere. God has always been, and God will always be. And me and you are just passing through. And y'all think that I'm going to be doing this Bible study at Mount Vernon forever. And one of these days, I'm going to pass away, and you're going to say, uh, we're going to have to get somebody else to do the January Bible study. Because Brother Robert is not, you know, I wasn't here in the beginning, and I won't be here when it's over. I'm just thankful I passed through and got to the fish fry. <laughs> All right. A little girl quoted that verse. She says he's the first and the last and all the letters in between. Uh, if we said it in English, we'd say he's the A and the Z. All right. Which was and is and all that. Verse 9. I, John, who also am your brother. What did I tell you was the best thing they could call you? Brother. Brother John. And companion in tribulation. We don't know anything about tribulation. TV preachers tell us we're all going to be rich. As soon as we send our donation in, we're going to be rich. Who wants to talk about tribulation? But 2 Timothy 3 and 12 says, All who live godly shall suffer persecution. He says he was on the island of Patmos. Now, I have made, I have told this story at a lot of churches. It directly affects Mount Vernon because it happened here. I was here one Sunday years ago trying to teach the book of Revelation, and I was mentioning the island of Patmos, and somebody at the sound system got a map of the, Googled a map of the world and showed us where Patmos was. And I have mentioned that several times at churches. I said, Mount Vernon is so sophisticated in their technology that they pointed out where Patmos was. I said, the next time I come, I'm going to ask them to show us a picture of heaven. <laughs> All right. Patmos is located in the Aegean Sea. It's under the control of Greece today. It's a little island there, and they usually sent people there to get rid of them, sort of like an exile. That's what they did to John. Why did they send him there? Was he a drug dealer? Look at this. He says, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. He was sent into exile because he believed the word of God and he was a faithful witness of Jesus Christ. And yet TV preachers telling us today that, you know, we have authority over Satan. We have authority over this and that. And we can just have anything we want. We just tell God what we want and he jumps to it. Verse 10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. What day of the week is the Lord's day? Do we need to count down? Five, four, three. <laughs> Who's going to stand up and take the microphone? Sunday. All right. That is the Lord's day. The Sabbath is Saturday. Sunday is the Lord's day. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. be great if we all were, wouldn't it? What would happen one Sunday if everybody at Mount Vernon was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day? You would have a Pentecostal revival. Behind me I heard a great voice as of a trumpet. That's what we need to be listening for now. When I was on my way to the fish fry, I passed by the cemetery out here, and I saw some names that I recognized. And I thought to myself, they're waiting on the trumpet. They're not there now. It's the, the, the physical remains, but they're waiting on the trumpet. And that graveyard out here is going to burst open. Uh, those that have uh, died in Christ, those who died lost, will stay in the grave for another thousand years. But the saved will come forth on that trumpet sounds, saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book. That's what Revelation is, a book. And send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia. And then he names the seven churches. Because of time, I'm going to skip that. I didn't think I'd, I thought I could, uh, I got to hurry up. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. 
And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Now, if you have a more up-to-date version of the Bible, I'm using the King James. If you have a different version, or if you're one of these that's got a cell phone and you're, you know, doing it by, on the cell phone, it's going to say probably uh, lampstands here. But it means the same thing. Uh, a candlestick. Seven golden lampstands or candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, now watch carefully because he's going to give us a description of how Jesus looked when he saw him in this vision. See if it matches up with the pictures of Jesus that you have hanging at your house. One like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, which is generally what priests wore in, in the Old Testament, uh, and gird about the paps, that means a belt, with a golden girdle, golden belt. His head and his hairs were white like wool. Is that the way Jesus looks in your pictures? You know why you have those pictures? Because an artist in the Middle Ages drew those. You, this will give you a better idea of what Jesus looks like when, when we see him in eternity. And uh, his eyes were as a flame of fire. In the Greek, it says shooting fire. In other words, he'll, have, he'll be able to see through you. You can't fool him now. You can fool me. You tell me the sky is falling, and I'll get under this pulpit. I'm about like Chicken Little Jr. I, you know, I'm easy to fool, but you can't fool him. And his feet like unto fine brass or bronze, that means judgment, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. All of you that like to go to the beach, which I assume is about 90% of Applin County and about 75% of Jeff Davis County is there right now. I don't know how anybody has time to work in Hazelhurst. When I go to Facebook, they're all at the beach. But the roar of the water is power. In fact, I have a little noise machine to help me sleep at night. I have to have some noise. And uh, it has all kinds of, uh, you know, you can hear all kinds of stuff. And the one I get is, is like uh, the sound of rushing waters. It, it helps calm me down. All right, verse 16. But now that's how Jesus looks. And in the letter to the seven churches, he's going to take one of these characteristics here from verses 12 to 16, and he will use them in, in describing those churches. And he had in his right hand seven stars. How are we supposed to know what that means? Verse 20 tells us that the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And it tells us that the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. So it interprets it for us. I don't know why anybody reads that and says, I don't know what that means. Well, all they got to do is go to verse 20. Had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. What does that remind you of? Hebrews 4.12. The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. See, the thing about a two-edged sword, it works both ways. When you come to church and you love the Lord and you love to hear Bible preaching and you want the Bible taught to you, you enjoy this. If you don't, you're miserable. Because the sword will either cut you or it'll be a blessing to you. It's two-edged. Verse 17, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Oh, I like that. Because you know what people on Facebook say. When somebody dies, maybe they like to hunt and fish, and they say, I bet so-and-so's in heaven now hunting and fishing. Oh, no, they're not. And they're not waiting to grow wings either. I am so tired of that, that so-and-so died and got their wings yesterday morning. Folks, God has created all of the angels he's ever going to create. We are not going to turn into angels. 
We are servants of God, sons of God. 1 John 3 and 2, Beloved, we are the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. But we're not going to turn into angels. That's based on that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. I enjoy watching it at Christmas, but it's a fiction. We're not going to turn into Clarence Oddbody. But when John, now remember John, when Jesus was on earth, he would lean over and lean on his breast. But when he saw him in eternity, he fell at his feet as though he were dead. Nobody, we're the sons of God, heirs and joint heirs with Christ, but we're not going to walk up to God and slap him on the back when we get to heaven. We're not buddy-buddy. We're not God's buddy buddies. We're his children. And we will... We will have respect. In verse, uh, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. He was dead. None of us can say that tonight. I can't tell you all, I am here tonight to speak, but uh, last month I was dead for three days, and I came back the third morning. No, y'all are thinking, we've got a mental case teaching this class. But Jesus says, I am he that was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And no other religion can say that. All of the other great religious teachers died and are still in the grave. He says, and I have the keys of hell and of death. Do you know, dear, if you got the keys, you can get in or out? I remember going to a little church in Dodge County. Little church. Didn't have but one deacon. He's dead now. I don't know what they've got. But uh, he was a sweet man. And I'd always get there early. I get to church early if I can. If I'm not here early, y'all know something's wrong. But I try to get here early. And... Uh, I would always get to that little church. It was out in the woods. There wasn't nothing anywhere around. And uh, he felt so sorry for me. He, he started leaving a key there in the, on the window pane. Uh, so I always knew that I didn't care if it, when they got there. I knew where the key was. And I just let myself in. If you got the key, aren't you glad Satan doesn't have the key? Because Jesus has got the key. All of these that are buried out here that we loved and are our family and friends and at other cemeteries and, and, and uh, those of us who will go to will, uh, the way of the grave before the Lord comes, he's got the key. We don't have to fear because he's got the key. He didn't let us in or out. Write the things which thou hast seen and which uh, are the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks or lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of seven churches and the seven candlesticks are the seven churches. And I have ten minutes. So let's start in chapter two. I, I did not know it would take that long in chapter one. I apologize. Chapter two. Sounds like a broken record here. Chapter two. Our first church. Now there's two ways y'all can look at this. Some people believe that these seven churches are in chronological order. In other words, it's a history of the church age. In other words, Ephesus was the first century church and then Smyrna was, you know, after that and on and on. And, and that may be true. That may be true. I, I have a little problem with that, but it may be true. But what I like to think is these seven churches represent the seven kinds of churches that are around today. I told you all last night, Mount Vernon's going to be one of these. But now you may not have all the characteristics. I don't have all the characteristics of being a fat person. But I've got enough of them. My BMI says I am. 
I don't like to think so. But anyway, he always starts every, every one of the seven churches unto the angel of the church. That word angel is angelos or angelos, and it means messenger unto the every church. And uh, some people think that every church has a guardian angel. I don't know. I know some of them I don't think got one because I've been fortunate to get out of there alive myself. <laughs> but, you know, I believe that we have a guardian angel, but I don't know if there's one for the whole church, you know, just watching over Mount Vernon. Maybe now, I just said I don't know. Angel there uh, could be translated pastor. When's the last time you've heard your pastor call an angel? We don't get called that much, do we? All right. So it could be just a messenger that God has assigned to each of the churches. And the church at Ephesus, the word Ephesus means desired ones. This church, if you will, uh, Ann or whoever's doing this, if you'll flip up Acts chapter 19, verses 18 and 19, I just want to show you how this church got started. Uh, the church at Ephesus. This is Acts 19.18. Paul was having a revival there. And it says, Many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. All right, what happened is, this is how that church got started at Ephesus. Uh, Paul had a revival there. It lasted three years. Don't you know Appling County would be different if Paul could come back and have a three-year revival here? And they got so excited, they brought their books of curious arts. What's that, what that means is uh, witchcraft, Ouija boards, fortune tellers, uh, you know, palm readers, uh, people who were dealt in the occult. Uh, they just brought all those books and piled them up and burned them. Do you know we'd have a great revival if we took stuff out of our house that doesn't belong there and got rid of it, we'd have a revival here. Might mean our television set would go first. Y'all are not interested in revival. I believe if we got really serious, the TV would go first. Uh, probably Facebook would be close behind the Internet. We got a lot of trash at our houses that don't belong there. Oh, there's some good stuff on it. There's some good stuff at the garbage can, you know, at the trash dump, but you don't go there to get your bread, do you? There's some good stuff there. Some people throw away things that aren't worn out. But overall, it's a bunch of garbage. That's why they call it a garbage dump. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand. What does that mean? The seven pastors who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. All right? Notice carefully, he's walking in the midst of the churches. That's where Jesus should be. In the midst of the church. In other words, everything at church should revolve around Jesus. If it revolves around the preacher or the choir or something else, that church is off base. Verse 2, I know thy works. This was a working church. Most churches aren't. Most churches feel like if I just get there on Sunday and go home about every other Sunday, I've done enough. Just get to church. They consider that as a major accomplishment. I know thy works and thy labor. Labor means they put more emphasis to it. Uh, and thy patience. That word patience means persistence. They didn't quit easily. And how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they're apostles and are not and hast found them liars. The word apostle means one sent from God. Now understand in those days they didn't have a Consolation Baptist Association in western Turkey. They didn't have an association of churches that were connected with an associational missionary. 
they were just independent churches. And so how do they know who to call as a preacher? Well, in those days, people would come by and say that I was uh, passing by here and the Lord spoke to me and told me that I needed to be the preacher at this church. And before they let him preach, they checked him out. What do you believe? What's your doctrines? And if those doctrines did not square with the Bible, they didn't let the guy in the pulpit. And do you know that's not a bad idea? If y'all don't trust me, you should never let me behind this desk. No preacher should ever stand behind this desk because he's somebody's brother-in-law once removed who you hadn't seen in 30 years, but he lives in Florida and here on vacation and, and, and you've never heard him before. You don't know what he believes because he can say some ridiculous stuff. It'll take Brother Darrell years to get out of the church. They tried people before they let them preach. Tried them in the sense of tested them. Verse 3, you have born and has patience for my name's sake, has labored and has not fainted. This was a good church. Here's the way I like to see these churches. I like to see this as an email from Jesus to the churches. And it's like Jesus just come here one Sunday morning and showed up and was sitting in the pew. What would he see at Mount Vernon that he would approve? What would he like about your worship services? What would he not like? What would, let's just say me and Brother Darrell, for example. Suppose Jesus showed up uh, here tomorrow night, for example, in a physical body. Would I have wished I'd studied more? You better believe it. If I knew Jesus was going to be in here tomorrow night in a physical body, I would go home and no TV tonight, no internet, no Facebook, no Alexa. It'd be serious business. But yet you know the sad thing, he is here in spirit. We need to treat him just like he was here in a physical body because he is, he's real. This was a good church, but it had one problem. I wonder if I have time. I got one minute to tell you what it is. I've got an idea if he went to most Baptist churches, he'd find more than one thing wrong. But he only found one thing wrong at this church. We call it the backslidden church. Because in verse 4, he says, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Now, sometimes I will use the expression, lost your first love. They really had not lost their first love. They had left it. And the first love is that love you had for Jesus when you first got saved. Do you remember how excited you were when you were first saved? When you realized you were going to go to heaven and not hell? I remember when I was first saved, I remember going to revivals for six consecutive weeks, 1964. I wasn't preaching at any of them. I was just going. I even went to the Methodist church. I was so excited. You see, but how is it now? Are y'all still excited? See, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like first love. It's like your honeymoon. Y'all know what the honeymoon is. It's time between I do and you better. That's honeymoon. And, you know, Preachers have honeymoons. They go to a church. I, I love to talk to people who have a new preacher. You know, how's y'all's new preacher? Oh, best thing's ever happened. We love him. He see him six months later. You know anybody you could recommend? You know, we, <laughs> that first love. Now, it's not that we're not saved anymore, but it's that we're not excited. We're not committed. We have lost our enthusiasm. We just go through the motions. I don't think we mean to do this. And it doesn't happen overnight. You don't go to bed Saturday night fired up, ready for Sunday, and get up Sunday morning a backslider. A lot of things distract us. Let me just quickly tell you how you can give yourself a test because I don't have time to explain this. I'm going to give you just a quick test. 
This is a self y'all can take home test. Uh, you still reading the Bible as much as you used to? Or is there something on TV you have to watch first? What's the first thing you turn on when you get in your house besides the lights? Your TV. You plan to read the Bible, but you got the TV on, and there's something on that you don't, you, you don't want to miss. You've been waiting. You know. All right. <clears throat> Another one is uh, you, you begin to get uh, critical of, of the church services. Well, he's too, he's too long-winded. I, I, I wish I wouldn't get him every year because, you know, he, he just keeps us on and on. said we'd be here an hour. It's already been an hour and three minutes. Uh, you become critical. The bill is too cold in here. Must be killing hogs. Or I'm about to burn up, you know, to be fanning away. Half the church is fanning and half of them are shivering. You begin to, I don't ever notice the temperature once I start speaking. I, I'm serious. I'm interested in the message. I don't care what, it's cold or hot. It doesn't bother me. When it's over, somebody say, did you get cold there? I don't know. I won't pay any attention to that. I didn't come here as an undercover agent for the Weather Channel. <laughs> but when you lose your first love or leave it, you become, you notice stuff. You know, I don't like the way they took up the offering. I don't like the idea of people standing at the door holding out an offering plate. Uh, and it become critical. But here's the main way you can tell. You're not interested in souls anymore. You don't care if people come or not, as long as your family's here. God bless me and my four no more. As long as I'm here and my family's here, we don't care. But Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't come so y'all could have carpeted pews and padded pews and carpet and central heat and air. <clears throat> and stream the services. <clears throat> he came to seek and to save that which is lost. If you're not interested in it, you've left your first love. I'm not saying you need to be resaved, but you do need to re be recommitted. Very quickly, I'm going to read verse 5, and uh, then we'll start in verse 6 tomorrow night because uh, actually... I, I can, you can get by we could really get by if I was speaking just on this I'd stop in verse 5 anyway verse 5 he tells them what to do about it and I, I do apologize for going a little over an hour I know it's little, what time it is but uh, he tells them what to do about it now if y'all went to the doctor and the doctor told you you had something wrong wouldn't you want to know what to do about it what good would it do to go to a doctor and he tells you you've got a mass growing you know, in your abdomen, and it's been nice seeing you come back in three months for your checkup. You'd say, no, Doc, what, what do we do about this mass? What do we do about this tumor? He mentions three things here in verse 5. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. Remember, that's the first word. Do you remember when you used to love Jesus more than you do now? Come on now. Y'all aren't fooling me. Is there, has there been a time when you were more excited about Jesus than you are tonight? Now, I know you don't like this, and I don't mean to be ugly. Please don't take it as a smart aleck remark. But if you ever love Jesus more than you do tonight, you are backslidden. Because you have slipped back from where you were. By the way, Angela, I appreciate your post last night. Uh, you need to be recognized. The second thing he says, and repent. That's a big word there. We hardly ever hear in the Baptist church anymore. Repent. Repent. It's the word metanoia. It literally means a change of mind. But how can you tell someone has changed their mind unless they change their behavior? What if I was a drug addict and I said, hey, I'm giving up drugs. I'm going to be clean from now on. How would we know that you meant it? You didn't take any more drugs. 
next time you see me, if I'm high as a kite, you'd say, well, he obviously didn't mean that because he's back where he was. Repent. It's a military word. It means turn around. If you're going in this direction, turn around and go this way. Repent. It's what's wrong with America. It's what's left out of most of the preaching on television. I never hear a sermon on television on repentance. But Jesus said in Luke 13, 3 and 13, 5, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. That's what Jesus said. And believe it or not, Brother Darrell, I was supposed to go to a church. It got canceled. But I was supposed to go to a church, and I love the preacher there, and I'm not doubting his salvation, but, but he does not believe that repentance is essential to salvation. There are, is some kind of group, I, and I don't know the name of it. I looked it up, but I, uh, they just think all you got to do is believe. The third thing he says and do the first works. In other words, repeat. Remember where you used to be. Repent or turn around. Go back. You say, I don't feel like I did then. Well, that's because you're not reading your Bible and you're not praying. If you'll start doing those things. See, it looks like feelings determine our will. If I don't feel like it, I'm not going on a diet. I don't care what the doctor says. I don't feel like going on a diet. But do you know if I'll make my body go on a diet, my feelings will come along and after a while, I'll enjoy it. Same way about going to the gym. If you make yourself go to the gym, you'll feel better after you've worked out because you've made your body do something it didn't want to do. But if you let your body push you around, you won't ever go. He says, or else I will come and move thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. We'll begin in verse 6 tomorrow night. Let me tell you this last thing here. This scares me. God says, now the candlestick is the church. God said, if you don't, do, if you don't remember, re repent, and return, I'm going to come move the candlestick. I believe that's what's going to happen to the United States of America. God's going to move the candlestick. I believe he allowed, as I said last night, Donald Trump to be elected president. Whether he's a Christian or not, it's not the deal. The question is, he's trying to turn America back to the right things. If we don't do it, God's going to come move the candlestick. Does that mean we'll all be lost again? No. But a church can go to nothing. Did you all know that? A church can go to nothing. The building's still there. But there's nothing happening. Have you ever been to the Jeff Davis County Fairgrounds in Hazelhurst? Some of you probably have. Hog shows and stuff. Jeff Davis County Fairgrounds. There's an old church there. They've restored it a little bit enough to move it. It was moved from out in the country. Where that church used to be, there's a little tiny graveyard, probably 15 or 20 graves. You have to walk down a cotton field to get to it. It's a little hard unless you know where you're going to find it. But they moved that building. But here's what I'm getting at. They weren't having church in that building anymore. But at one time, it was an active church. My mother used to tell me about it, that it was an active church. It went to nothing. Can a church go to nothing? God came one day. I don't know what went on in that church. But he moved the candlestick. That's what happened to Ephesus. See, this church we studied tonight, we got six more to go now, two nights. Common Core says three per night. God moved the candlestick because if you went to Ephesus tonight, would you find that church there? No. You know what's there instead? The Muslims. That's what's going to happen here. God's going to move the candlestick in this country. We've already got several Muslims now in Congress. In Congress. People have been fussing on Facebook about some of the language they're using against the president. 
Well, what stupid people elected them? How did they get there? They didn't just walk into Congress. I can't just walk into Congress and say I'm going to represent Georgia in the House of Representatives or the Senate. Somebody had to elect them. I say the people that voted for them are dumber than the ones who are making these remarks. But they're all crazy. <laughs> but God's going to move the candlestick. Now you watch it. If I die between now and next year, or but I'm telling you it's coming. He's going to move the candlestick because you know that America needs to turn back to God. Any country has got abortion clinics running day and night and approving homosexual marriages and all the crap that we're approving and people shacked up, living together, not married, and all this kind of stuff, we need to repent. And if preachers can't find something to preach about today, we might as well quit and start selling insurance because there's plenty of sin to preach about. But I've said my say, like Amos McCoy, like last night, I've had my say. I thought we'd get further along tonight. Y'all just obviously weren't listening fast enough. What happens when you eat too many fish? Your listening ability slows down. But I promise you, I promise you we will finish these seven churches. Don't think that Wednesday night we're going to come and, and just be on church number two, and here we are on Wednesday night, and it's supposed to be seven. We're, we're going we're gonna to do three tomorrow night. I hope.